Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. You can always check out the pictures on the World of Warbirds Facebook page in order to see what is being described today. Dear listeners, this piece started off with just being an introduction to a regular Warbirds episode where I was going to be talking about my personal connections to the Avril Lancaster. However, it seems that I had more to say on the subject than I had originally thought. To push ahead with a regular episode would be far too lengthy, as the Lancaster is already such a rich topic, after this blockbuster of an introduction. I fear it would make the episode just too bloated, so I will split this one off into a bonus and profile properly the Lank next time. The Avril Lancaster is the warbird with which I have the most personal connections with over the years, and it's probably the primary reason for my obsession with warbirds in the first place. And it's thus the reason that I am engaged in making this podcast that you are now listening to. As a kid growing up in the 70s, I had found a souvenir aircraft recognition pamphlet that my parents had brought back from the National Aviation Museum in Ottawa. Two planes in that booklet really got my attention. The first was the Henkel HE-162 Volksjager, partly because it looked so weird with the jet engine on the back, and also because it had a swastika painted on it, which, as a kid, I knew was taboo. The other one was the Avril Lancaster. Although the details on power plants, range, weaponry, didn't make any sense to me, the picture itself was so impressive. The thing just seemed to exude power. It didn't hurt that it was painted black, or very dark, and in my child's mind, the idea that this machine went out at night to punish the bad Nazis made it a superhero in my mind. The icing on the whole cake was that on the Lancaster's page in the booklet, the last section was a general impression where only two words were written, simply massive. It was as if the serious writers of this serious booklet had also been overwhelmed. Wow, what an airplane. I was hooked. So I made my fair share of lanks out of Lego, which flew many missions over the enemy territory of my younger brother's room. Some of these, like the real thing, failed to return to base. Then I discovered the Dam Busters movie. Wow, again. They were using my favorite airplane to fly low and knock out Nazi dams, just like the climactic scene in Star Wars, except exchange lanks for X-Wings and the Wallace bouncing bombs for proton torpedoes. Wait a minute, was it possible that Star Wars copied the Dam Busters? My mind was blown before I even knew that expression. Then one day my dad revealed that his boss, who was the part owner of his consulting engineering firm, had flown as a navigator in Lanx. I pushed for details and stories, and was to be disappointed when dad wasn't able to provide any juicy combat tales. He had reported that his boss had considered it the most boring job he had ever done. Sitting in the dark, having to calculate their position every 15 minutes, over and over again. He said that they had never seen a night fighter and that they were only mildly worried about the flak. He said it was because he had entered the service late and that the war was basically over. Was it just modesty or a strategy to avoid talking about the war? I have no way of knowing. Most of his stories were about stealing coal to keep their hut warm. Visiting Brits would ask why the hut was so much warmer than theirs and the Canucks would answer that because they came from Canada, they knew how to make a fire better. He also had a tip to avoid being tapped for extra duties at the air station, which I remember during my own military service and even out into the working world. He said to walk fast and carry a handful of papers or blueprints, and the superiors will figure that you've already got something more important to do, and they'll leave you alone. One ominous story that gave me the shivers was that he said if they were ever lost and tried to use the radio to ask for help, they would be quickly given directions by a sweet-sounding lady who spoke perfect English. 
Of course, the lady was a member of the Luftwaffe, and she would direct them to their doom in the sights of a German night fighter. During elementary school, I entered a mail-in contest where I had to write a short essay about my dream of a lifetime, and I wrote that I wanted to parachute out of a Lancaster bomber. Yes, I guess I was a weird kid. Anyway, I didn't win the contest. One summer, during early high school, while staying at a friend's cottage, I discovered his dad's bookshelf. If you're about my age, and you're listening to a Warbirds podcast, then you probably remember discovering a bookshelf like this. It's a bit like finding a stash of Playboys. This one was stuffed with books about the war, about the SS, about tanks, and the long row of that Time Life Encyclopedia about the Second World War. Again, if you're my age, you've seen it. Hardcover with black and white pictures and red foil titles on the covers. Pre-internet, this was treasure. But the book that really got me was Len Dighton's Bomber. After a day of water skiing, playing in the lake, and eating hot dogs and marshmallows, I curled up and read this amazing book that covers the story of one RAF bombing raid. The story is a couple of paperback inches thick and only covers the period of one night, but includes everyone involved from the civilians near the RAF aerodrome to the RAF leadership planning the raid to the armorers and mechanics prepping the plane to the Lancaster crews getting ready to the night fighter and flak crews trying to hunt them down, to the regular German citizens on the ground at the receiving end of the raid. It's unflinchingly honest, and I think it's neutral. And although it's fiction, it's brutally truthful. No one is good or bad. They have all been funneled by fate and history into this meat grinder of battle. The flight crews on both sides are astonishingly real, and the characters are all well-rounded. There is the tired, almost washed-up Lancaster pilot who doesn't even need to take notes during the briefing, to the brand new guys on their first mission who are more worried about making mistakes in their logbook than they are of the flak. Even the Luftwaffe night fighter guys weren't monolithic Nazi supermen. There was the hardcore perfectionist, and the sloppy pilot who didn't follow procedure, and all the others in between. In print, this book so vividly brought us along on the raid that after reading it, you feel like you've been there. You feel like you know enough to hop in, grab a checklist, start up, and take off. Here's a little confession. I didn't finish the book that night, and so I took it home from the cottage, intending to return it after. I never did. I've still got it. That was 35 years ago. Shh, don't tell. Fast forward to when I was doing my own flight training in my early 20s. When I was doing my night flying training, it brought me back to that book, and it struck me suddenly one day at the tremendous difficulty of what the real Lancaster crews did. I like flying at night. Even aside from all the technological aids such as ADF, VOR, GPS, when it comes to visually flying at night, I found it easier to navigate, as the cities and towns are all glowing blobs of light. Even the highways are all lit up pathways from the headlights of the traffic below. It's so easy to visually follow roads. However, when I thought about trying to find a city, hours away, with all the lights below blacked out, and half the electronic navigation aids either being jammed or false, and hundreds of thousands of Germans all trying to kill you with radar, searchlights, night fighters, flak, and doing this all in the cold, hypoxic upper atmosphere, and only after a couple of hundred hours of training, and being a teenager or a 20-year-old, wow, the realization hits hard. Also, while flying at our flight school, I met my first actual Lancaster vet, Paul who had been a navigator, and also became an engineer after the war. He was a character, ex-RAF with the British accent and gentlemanly yet slightly doddering demeanor. 
He didn't talk too much about his wartime experiences, although I do remember him one time uh, when I overheard him talking about what it was like to be flying through a spot of flak and rubbish. It sounded very British. We need to fast forward again slightly to get to my first view of a real Lancaster in action. This was during my 300 nautical mile commercial cross-country flight. I'm not sure if all countries do this, but planning and flying a flight to an airport 300 nautical miles out from your origin is a requirement for the Canadian Commercial Pilot's License and was the longest cross-country flight that I had done at the time. The training program that I was following obliged me to fly from Montreal, Quebec to London, Ontario in a Cessna 172, which would fulfill the requirement. However, I had planned to make a stop at Hamilton, Ontario to visit the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum and to see their Lancaster, which is named Vera. Of course, the timing didn't work out, and my flying companion Dennis and I were disappointed that we couldn't visit the museum. There just wasn't enough time. However, while I was doing my walk around on the Cessna, we heard from across the field the thrum, thrum, thrum of engines that we did not recognize. Could those be Merlins? Yes! The Lank taxied out, ran up, and then took off right in front of us. Dennis took picture after picture. This was pre-digital, and we didn't know if any of those pictures would turn out. But they did. And now the cover of the World of Warbirds podcast is one of those pictures. Many years later, camping near Niagara Falls, I again heard that distinctive thrum, thrum, thrum of the four Merlins overhead. And there was Vera again. Niagara Falls and the only Canadian flying lank in the world on one day. Does it get any better? However, growing older, I no longer see the Lancaster and what it did through rose-colored glasses. As if it was some sort of historic, real-world machine hero, you know, like the Millennium Falcon on Star Wars. There is no controversy with the Falcon. However, during my lifetime, there has been increasing debate over the effectiveness and the ethics of strategic bombing in general, and the area bombing that our Commonwealth Lancasters were doing in particular. A CBC documentary production called Death by Moonlight enraged many former aircrew because of its portrayal of the ineffectiveness and questionable ethics of their mission. The award-winning documentary caused such a brouhaha that veterans groups sued the filmmakers, and the Senate of Canada actually held hearings about it. The Queen Mum tried to have its broadcast in the UK blocked, and though many different types of aircraft such as Halifaxes, Stirlings, etc. were involved in the bombing campaign, like it or not, it has come to be represented by the Lancaster. The Canadian War Museum also ran into a similar controversy with its exhibit on strategic bombing. The veterans groups again appealed to the Senate, who although they agreed that the exhibit was historically accurate, ask that the wording be changed somewhat to discuss nuances more. I think all sides are looking to tell the truth, but which flavor of the truth? As I record this, the world is again struggling to define what happened during the war and how it is to be remembered by trying to decide if statues and memorials to Bomber Harris and Bomber Command should be taken down. As an amateur historian, I worry about erasing memory. Although he was talking about a different war, I find a quote by William Tecumseh Sherman fits perfectly. You quote, You cannot quantify war in harsher terms than I will. War is cruelty, and you cannot refine it. And those who brought war into our country deserve all the curses and maledictions that a people can pour out. I know I had no hand in making this war, and I know I will make more sacrifices today than any of you to secure peace. So far, the Lancaster aircraft itself has escaped being labeled as a machine of war crimes, nor has there been any call to ground them in the name of not glorifying what they did. 
I think seeing these surviving aircraft on the ground and in the air help us learn and remember. One way or another, the sacrifices of those who participated in these battles need to be remembered. I just seem to keep running into connections with the Lancaster. When I'm not sweating over a World of Warbirds podcast episode, I work as an administrator at a high school. From the very beginning, I started an aviation club for the kids. One of my teacher colleagues, Peter Harding, and I were talking about the club one day, and he told me about his dad, John Harding, who had flown in Lanx during the war, again as a navigator. I said that it's too bad he didn't write down his experiences. Peter said, he did. He wrote a book called The Dancing Navigator, and Peter brought it to me to read the next day. As part of the aviation club, I take kids up for rides in a Cessna 172. For the students who are really enthusiastic, we plan a cross-country flight from Montreal to Ottawa Rockcliffe Airport, which is a former Royal Canadian Air Force base and the site of the National Aviation Museum of Canada. It's a thrilling day for the kids when we land and taxi to our parking spot behind the museum and then get let in like Big Shot VIPs through the airside doors. This is Big Shot VIPs in quotations. We do arrive in a beat-up rented Cessna 172 and not in a private jet. I've done the tour of the museum so many times that I can give it myself, and it's always a high point of the experience when we stop in front of the magnificent Lancaster Mark 10 KB944 named Winnie. Maybe it's just my overactive imagination, but its size and prominent place in the center of the museum make it seem as if it is presiding over the entire collection. We always stop and talk about how this type of Lancaster was built in Canada and what terrible things it was built to do. I say terrible, not in judgment, but with the meaning that this airplane was able to unleash awesome power on an enemy city and by doing so, certainly shortened the war for everyone. We always take a picture in front of Winnie and then linger a bit at the exhibit where you can look inside the no section of another Lank where my students are always in awe that kids not much older than themselves flew the aircraft and operated its systems in the middle of the night and under such harsh and cramped conditions. So along with this podcast that I am pleased to share with you, This is what I see as my continuing role in spreading the fascination and the information about these aircraft. As for my love affair with the Lank, it isn't over. I no longer wish to parachute out of a Lancaster. I understand that, at least in combat, it could be quite difficult to get out of one. Besides, I don't think the museum organizations that fly them would be too keen. Anyway, I've got a few parachute jumps under my belt, and I think I'm done with that activity. However, it certainly is possible to buy a ride in Vera, and this I have yet to do. And if I ever do get the chance, I will be sure to take you listeners along with me for the ride. In one last sad connection, this week we lost Vera Lynn, the namesake of the Canadian Airworthy Lank that I've been mentioning in this episode, who died at the age of 103. For the young pilots who flew the Lanx and the other warbirds that we explore in this podcast, Vera Lynn was a major part of the soundtrack of their lives, and her songs have become emblematic of the entire time frame of the conflict. Today we will wrap up the episode with one of her iconic tunes. Thanks for listening, and please, if you enjoyed this episode, Please share it with a friend. We'll meet again Don't know where Don't know when But I know we'll meet again Some sunny day Just like you always do Till the blue sky